The rules for the challenge are as follows. 1. I can only use items and equipment I find in an area to progress through it, which includes fighting enemies and bosses. Dark Souls 2 also has unique transitional areas that I will count as either the area before it or after it, whichever is the most convenient at the time. 2. There are some exceptions to the items, such as for key items required for game progression, like Fragrant Branches of Yore, but also certain consumables, such as most healing items, Estus upgrades, soul items, human effigies, and torches. Other consumables, however, I can only use if I find them in the area. I also will permit Pharaoh's lockstone usage no matter where I find them. Rule number three. If I find a bow, I will allow myself to use any type of arrows or bolts no matter where I found them. Four. I can use boss souls only if said boss is not the end of the area, despite technically having to leave the area to transpose the souls. Rule number five, I will try my best to match the level of the area, so I won't over-upgrade my weapons or farm beyond reason. I would like to preface this run by saying that it was inspired by another YouTuber's run by the name of JK Leeds, who did this exact same challenge but for Elden Ring mini dungeons. I will link all that in the description, plus another YouTuber I found who has done this challenge for the other two Dark Souls games, who goes by Mr. Metagross. With that out of the way, let's start the challenge. Things start off pretty simple. The warrior class already has a weapon that's available here, so I might as well just use that until I find something new. We also quickly pick up our first dorky helmet that doesn't even fit on our head. I managed to die by being stupid before I even get to the Cardinal Tower, all the while being too stubborn and arrogant to light the first bonfire, thinking I would just breeze through. So guess who gets to run through all those guys again? I do make it through to the next bonfire, and we can finally start our journey scavenging for loot. I make a quick detour to grab the Estus Shard, booking it out of there before the pursuer can land. My first weapon is a wing spear drop from one of these guys, which I don't have the stats for, but decide to use anyway. And honestly, despite that, it isn't such a bad start, as the damage is comparable to what I was doing with my broken straight sword anyway. After getting the shortcut, we return to Majula and level our decks a little bit. It's still not enough, but it isn't really a problem this early in the game. Under the Ballista Room is where our first ring is, behind the door these guys kindly open for us. On my way back up, I try to be cheeky and kill these guys with a Ballista, and I'm quickly reminded of our class divide. So instead, I decide to try my hand at Pate's little gauntlet, picking up a few pieces of gear along the way. I get a crossbow that I use for the sole purpose of picking off these enemies guarding the Mailbreaker, who managed to kill me the first time. I get the Mailbreaker and also buy a few things before taking on the first boss of this area. Just for fun, I start this fight using the five witching urns we found by the Cardinal Tower, wasting two out of five by just missing him entirely. Other than that, nothing out of the ordinary about this fight. I got hit by some things that I definitely shouldn't have gotten hit by, but I managed to finish this fight without much trouble. So now it's time to head towards our next mark. I put the levels into vigor and pick up the ring of restoration I unlocked with the soldier key. The Grand Lance could also be an option, but I decided to stick with the Mailbreaker for the time being. Making our way through the Room of Skeletons with a mission in mind, we are ready to get our first full set of armor. I frantically try to put on all the armor while I am invaded by Dennis the Menace, who quickly rushes towards me with at least three turtles in tow. I escape to the roof for a bit of peace, and for a 1v1 battle with Armorer Dennis. Watch as I grab the Bastard Sword only to completely ignore it. My Mailbreaker gets broken, and I am forced to switch to a different weapon. And for whatever reason, I mistakenly thought I couldn't wield the Bastard Sword, so I proceed to equip the Halberd which I actually couldn't wield. I miss three swings at point blank, and pick up this whip, which I decide to equip for fun. I may not be able to use it, but boy does this thing get the job done. I show the invader who's dominant around here, and he quickly cracks under the might of my whip. To use this whip, we're gonna need to whip ourselves into shape, so I opt for a relaxing farming session for that extra level. 
Now that we have the stats for it, I go straight for the Pursuer. As tempting as it is, I ignore the beckoning of the Ballista and fight him fair and square with the Whip. This fight actually went a lot better than I expected, and I managed to get him first try, although it was very tense and I had some close calls. Fun fact, my face was itching really badly throughout this whole fight, so that was nice for an added layer of difficulty. I use the levels from this to get strength and dex to 20, putting whatever is left into endurance. On our way to the Tower of Flame, we get a humble shield to work with right off the bat, as well as the broken thief sword. Hooray? After looking at the repost damage, yeah, this isn't gonna work. The only ring here is the Ring of Binding, so I make the enemies fall off the ledge one by one to easily take it from the chest. Of course, this ring will only be useful if I die, but being the god I am at this game, I won't manage to die when all I have to do to win is literally nothing. Stage fright from recording my first video? Let's go with that! But in any case, you WILL make a pact to never speak of this again. Miracles could be fun, but the stat investment isn't really doable right now. I head down to grab the old knight halberd, and we get rid of this knight to claim our first piece of sublime bone dust. More levels into endurance will never hurt. This area is a prime example of why you should never be impatient in Souls games, let me tell you. What should have taken 20 minutes at the most turned into a 40 minute run because I was just too impatient to kill all these enemies going up to the drake every time. I ended up trying to skirt around the gank squad every time, but once I finally decided to suck it up and just fight the enemies again, I take down the drake very easily. But as you can see, the durability on this weapon is a pretty good defense as to why I tried to just run past everything. We start on a clean slate for Blue Ornstein, and this fight goes as you'd expect. There are a few of these AoE farts that you have to watch out for, but other than that, I mean, he's Blue Ornstein. Okay, upon closer inspection, he isn't really blue. But doesn't it just feel right to say he's Blue Ornstein? I put our next levels into ADP because if you don't level that, you're trolling, am I right? Don't mind me just stocking up on healing items for the next area because we are gonna need them. We head towards what was the bane of my existence in my first playthrough with nothing but a torch and our bare hands. No Man's War starts out with a lot of back and forth and trades between my torch and the enemy's swords and arrows until I finally pick up a weapon. We can only two hand this one, but it isn't a huge deal. I decided to level it to plus one, which ended up being pointless because I instantly changed my mind. I get a new dorky helmet and talk to my friend Lucatil. I buy our first ring from Gavlin and get some shiny new gear from the dark stalker enemies next door. But since I'm feeling spontaneous, I do another gear swap and one last weapon swap with the Varangian sword. We break into this little cave for the final ring of the area, and with that, we are ready to head towards the boss. I also quickly dispatch the ship's crew while I'm at it. I start this fight out with a little mix-up, throwing in some knives I picked up around the area. An instance of greed nearly cost me this whole fight, with a pixel of health being my only saving grace, but... Being honest, after that whole fiasco with the you-know-what, even if I had died to this, I've already hit rock bottom, so I, I can't possibly humiliate myself any more than I already have. Before going to the next area, I light the first bonfire real quick and return to Majula to put a few more levels into strength and dex. I backtrack to the Pursuer Arena to get the Dole Ember from the Tower Apart bonfire. After I get that, I immediately warp back to the cells to grab the first weapon we'll be using in the Lost Bastille. There's a neat little secret if we ride the top of the elevator. A simple scimitar waits for us in this little hole, and even if it is basic, for me, curved swords are really fun to use in Dark Souls, and seeing as we haven't had the chance to use one yet, why not start here? As a side note, weapon variety is just another part of the fun in these types of challenges. I think it is most interesting to try to diversify with weapon classes as much as possible. Okay, this is getting a little excessive. 
sometimes all you need to clear your mind is a good rematch with one of your pursuer acquaintances here. I do die to this one a few times, but before long the pursuer is down and we are free to grab our lovely greed ring. Not the best for combat utility, but nobody can say no to some extra dough on the side. The next necessity on the list is the antiquated key and a little break for some small talk with Lucatiel. At long last, I successfully infiltrate Macduff's shop, being sure to light the torch so we can open the metal chest in the far side of the room. I get butt sweat on my hands for nothing because I don't even use the craftsman's hammer in this run. He has some cool weapons that you could try yourself in your version of this run, but I stick with the scimitar and upgrade it to prepare for the area some more. I'm honestly a little impressed with how perfectly I managed to pull this off. Seriously, if you don't kill these little Radley guys immediately, they will just stun lock you until all your gear is broken. Speaking of gear, I pick up the first armor set in this area, which is the Wanderer set, which I am going to keep the whole time. There are other options in this area to satisfy fashion enthusiasts of all tastes, but I really like the way this set looks. Returning to the Pharos Lockstone Room, there is a plethora of weapons here. I will certainly choose one of these later on in this area, only time will tell which one it will be. Enough looting, it's time to head up the lift because we have a very important task to get to. A couple rooms above is where we need to go to, to free our first NPC capable of soul transposition. Before the Ruined Sentinels, Vigor is probably the wisest way to spend these souls. Going into this fight, I was super nervous but ended up being pleasantly surprised at how well this went. And this was achieved by just trying to be a little more confident in myself, you know, fighting it as usual, just going ham on Yahim before the reinforcements arrive. Another cool thing I got to utilize was the single gold pine resin you can get in this area, which I used to its fullest potential, since I was able to first try it this time around. Our weapon almost breaks here too, but it does allow us to finish Reach A with the funny number, hearty har har. There's lots of little goodies we can get after this fight too. It's kind of nice to stop and smell the roses after a tense battle. My next weapon of choice is the most accessible one of the three from earlier, the Twin Blade. But it is a pretty fun and unique weapon, and I haven't tried one in DS2 in forever. After finding the Sentinels, I explore the area a little more and pick up items I find scattered along the way. We also head out to the Sinner's Rise, but we won't be fighting the Lost Sinner just yet. There are a few potentially important items here, mainly the Blossom Kite Shield, which is a great tool for any situation, and the Northern Ritual Band since we're here. Okay, how many times have I exploded in this run? I swear it's up to like five. Once we can finally activate this mechanism without further disturbances, I decide to head towards Belfry Luna. Some people consider this an area all on its own, but I am just going to treat it as a subdivision of the rest of the Bastille for the purposes of this playthrough. Getting through these guys is a little annoying, but you know what they say, work smarter, not harder. I strategically make these chumps fall down the ladder, a little trick I perfected in Farron's Keep. We also can't forget our trusty blue tear stone ring. I really want to use the bellkeeper bow for some reason. It could add a little spice to this fight, don't you think? I don't know what I was expecting to happen, but as you can see, the damage on this is terrible and it is too slow to justify using in this fight, which is basically just a four kings style DPS test. I kind of do all right on the first try, but I ran out of healing items and there was just no saving it at that point. The Belfry Gargoyles are the first really difficult boss for this run, taking me like four tries to beat. Something about the combination of the Twin Blades' inability to hit them in succession consistently, therefore defeating its whole purpose as a viable weapon, and me having no sense of stamina conservation made this a bit of a pain. We give the Bellkeeper Bow one last kiss goodbye as it picks off some of these pesky dogs. Defeating the NPC is easy enough and I claim a few more weapons. I get the Dragon Tooth and the Enchanted Falchion, and I go with the latter. There's also a boring story behind this choice, allow me to explain it to you, my captive audience, while we prepare for the Lost Center. Basically, I had a plan to use it in tandem with the Bone Staff, and originally was going to try to fight the Lost Sinner using only the homing Solero from the Ruined Sentinel Soul. 
I thought the ring from Strayed would be enough and that I would be able to farm for the remaining intelligence required, but I really, really misremembered the requirement for this spell, so that whole plan fell through. Oh well. Don't you just love a nice elevator ride with some dude's mangled corpse sticking out of the floor? The fight against the Lost Sinner isn't that hard, especially with this handy dandy bright bug I picked up from the Belfry Luna. It goes without saying that I make a few on-brand mistakes, but I manage to quickly bring a close to this fight before she can get another word in edgewise. I play it safe and get our vigor up to 30 before we continue onwards. I give the rest of my paycheck to my favorite televangelist and we head out to the unforgiving Huntsman's Cops. It is actually pretty fun to just beat these guys up and get rid of my leftover anger from the gargoyles. But I do get a proper weapon pretty quickly, using it to hold me over until the first bonfire. I was really, really hoping to get a full moon sickle drop from one of these guys, but of course, as I'm having my fun backstabbing, Forlorn comes to crash the party, and an almost five minute chase ensues. While I'm being chased by Forlorn and a few other schmucks, I pick up a morning star and equip it mid-fight out of desperation. The bleed buildup is very helpful in this situation, and I decide that it's a keeper for most of this area. I will be grateful for this jacket, even if it is the only thing I get. The rest of this area leading up to the main boss isn't super exciting, it's mainly just going through the motions of getting the undead lockaway key, freeing Creighton, and making our way back. I reinforce the morning star to plus two because trust me, that's sufficient for our purposes. Nothing to report with the skeleton lords either. It's a room full of enemies and you fight them all. I don't know what else to say about this one. I feel like this fight will always go the same way no matter what build you have. I thought it would be fun to try the Roaring Halberd next. Apparently I didn't learn my lesson from earlier. But guess what? There's no reason to fret because look what we found just lying around in the woods. Even though this goes against my every instinct, I'm gonna use it for the Executioner's Chariot. With this first fall off the ledge, the fun is just getting started. <laughs> just wait till I kill this red guy and we can actually start the run-ups to the boss. I already sort of had worst case scenarios played out in my head for this one. I imagined that the whip would actually be awful in this fight, because it would probably clank against the narrow walls when I try to kill the necromancers. And however bad my most pessimistic imaginings, None of them could have been worse than the reality. As it turns out, the weapon itself was just the tip of the iceberg. Not only was the physical damage itself really low to compensate for its high bleed damage, but the skeletons account for every single death in this fight, and they have no more blood for me to spill. There also is the added psychological threat of the impending chariot looming around the corner at all times, so sometimes I just end up rolling back into the skeletons just to find another hiding spot. I just got stuck in these walls so many times because I did such little damage that I had to replenish my stamina before the necromancers were even dead. And by then, all the skeletons got up to wobble me in my favorite game. Oh, and let's not forget the times that I didn't even make it to the boss because the enemies chased me to the fog gate and hit me out of the entering animation. And this whip guy in particular had a habit of just waiting around forever and just standing there, menacingly. The first time I finally reach the lever, I forget that Dark Souls 2 has no iframes for levers. I end up going back to the forest of fallen giants to pick up extra titanite shards to at least give myself a sliver of a chance at beating this. You don't even know how relieved I am to actually fight the boss. It is almost relaxing to just be able to take it slow and dodge its attacks. Good lord, the catharsis I got from this is insane. Also, shout out to this single surviving skeleton who put aside our differences and offered me moral support towards the end of this fight. You are appreciated. That fight was a wake-up call that it's time to level ADP again. Being able to just eat this guy after all that suffering, this is the way things should be. Before I get any equipment in Earthen Peak, 
I talk to the useful NPCs found in this area and fend off a few skeletons. This skeleton gives me a foot soldier shield that I equip for no reason at all, and I check back with Gavlin to see what's new in his shop. Since he sells a new copy of the Ring of Giants, this means that I am allowed to use the one I already bought, since it would be kind of pointless to buy another one. I do a few death runs through the poison pools to get some more items we might need in this run. The first weapon is behind this breakable wall. It is the Old Knight Pike this time. The durability on Old Knight weapons is always very low, but it doesn't matter this time around because I will not be using this weapon for long. I pick up the washing pole from another poison pool, and since I haven't used a katana, this will be the main weapon for this area. The durability of the washing pole is just as bad as the old night pike, but I'll be sure to be watchful of this going forward. I upgrade it to plus three and find a heavy crossbow of the same level to accompany it. Lucatil gives us the ring of steel protection plus one to add to our repertoire and we pop a pharaoh's lockstone to get another ring, which is the poison bite ring. After this, I head off to fight the covetous demon and hear me out on this one. I feel like these types of things only happen when you are playing on camera because I have never been hit by this licking attack in my life. At least it doesn't hurt us much because we barely have anything to even take off. Once that thing is out of the way, I use its soul to make the bone scythe, which I equip in my second weapon slot to use with my katana. I also put one more level into strength before heading back out to upgrade it. Things in Earth and Peak are off to a great start, and I pick up the mannequin mask, having to do a double take to register its beauty. Our heavy crossbow comes into play many times to get rid of hiding enemies. After killing the desert sorceress sniper, I am able to fill all four ring slots. I have the time of my life killing these mannequins over and over and somehow only get one piece of their armor from all that. But I meet Gilligan and swap out the mannequin top for the black leather set. I also advance Pate's quest before moving on. Later on in the area, I switch to the bone scythe and it has a very satisfying sweet spot mechanic that helps out a ton. I'm not a huge fan of the DS2 scythe follow-up attack, so I usually just wait for the animation to end instead of spamming R1. If you take out the Mimic in this room, you will get a work hook, which definitely is another interesting choice for this type of run, but I am too invested in the weapons I have to switch. Before fighting Mytha, I equip Black Fire Bombs and Hexing Urns, which I found earlier. I begin the fight by chucking these at her, and the Black Fire Bombs do pretty well on their own. With only 6 of these, she is down to almost 75% of her health bar, but I could not say the same about the Hexing Urns. I try one and just switch to melee for the rest of the fight, but I do whip out the urns one more time to style on her for the kill. Next, we head up the lift to the Iron Keep so we can return to Majula for a few extra levels into strength. We head out from Majula towards the Shaded Woods, which seems much more fitting than the Iron Keep at this stage. After chatting with Benhart, the way ahead is blocked by the petrified Rosabeth, and I go ahead and take out a few of these stinky dudes before freeing her because it's the polite thing to do. We also have to get through the Uggo Gauntlet before getting the first bonfire, which I die to. But once we pass them, we're free to pick up the Estus Shard and make our way towards the next bonfire. Each fork on the road has a piece of equipment for us to pick up. First, I get the Red Tearstone Ring. And over the falconers and through the woods, we get a very good weapon, which is the Dragon Slayer's Crescent Axe. I get invaded by Forlorn in a pretty inopportune area, but they aren't too hard to fend off. It's too bad I can't use any spells though, because there is a clear blue stone ring plus one here. I also pick up the old sun ring, which will be exciting because I've never used this one before. And finally, the classic Chloranthi ring plus one. We head on over to Vengarl and check out his shop, but I don't buy anything except for a few lightning urns for whatever reason. Before doing anything else in this area, I do a quick jump across the ledge to get some free sublime bone dust, and a black knight halberd as well. We won't be using it this time around, since it has intelligence and faith requirements. There are quite a few NPCs we can find in this area. The most important one is Ornifex, our other soul transposer. There's also Creighton, whose quest we can advance a little further, and Dark Diver Grondal, who we'll need later on in this playthrough. I return to Majula briefly to claim the Sublime Bone Dust before taking on the area boss.
Scorpion as Nachka isn't very difficult to take down, and while the lightning urns are very underwhelming, our axe picks up the slack and even unupgraded does formidable damage. I was hoping to get a little more use out of the old sun ring, but it tended to explode when she wasn't near the hitbox, but regardless, it was a pretty chill fight, and we can now advance towards the doors of Pharos. The levels from the Shaded Woods go into Endurance and a little more ADP. I also decided that it might be nice to start leveling up Intelligence and Faith for later on. Before taking on the Doors of Pharos, I backtrack some to clear out the other domain of the rats. We have enough health to survive the pit without the need of Gilligan's Ladders. Which is good, because I am out of money. In hindsight, maybe it wasn't worth all the effort, but I died seven times trying to get this one ring for the area. I feel like this run has been cursed with bad luck, or perhaps it has been blessed with some extra comedic value. I pick up the ring of the evil eye plus one, and go further down to get the ash knuckle ring. There's also another piece of sublime bone dust waiting down here. I was gonna just light the bonfire to get back up, but this works too. The Grave of Saints is a very uneventful area. There is very little to even do here. You can beat up some of the undead for some tattered clothes, but other than that, there is nothing else by way of equipment. There is an NPC invasion here, however, and he adds a little more fun as an extra challenge to this otherwise bare-bones location. He also stupefies me with what are perhaps the sickest tap-dancing moves I have ever seen. Unfortunately, he doesn't drop anything special for us, which is disappointing, because that means we will have literally nothing to fight the boss with. Just in case a magical weapon appears that I forgot about, I check across the Lockstone Bridge before our departure. But alas, it is just a spell, and not even a really good one. This marks the first area where we have no choice but to face the area boss with nothing but our fists. I also equip the torch because some part of me wants to believe it will help. Using the torch isn't really worth it as a backup weapon because you can easily be wobbled by these rats when using it. So this fight instead consists of a whopping six minutes of beating up ten rats with my bare hands, and then beating up their leader with my bare hands. I get a little scare in the middle of this when I get poisoned because dying would mean I have to go through all six minutes again. Fundamentally, this fight was not hard, but with only my fists and a torch, I feel like it was a test of patience and mental fortitude. I even out my faith a bit and we're off to the doors of Pharos. In the Doors of Pharos, we reunite with Gavlin one last time, and also re-equip the Ring of Giants. I also buy a few more things from his shop for a nice gift, the Garum Great Axe. This is another one of those areas with a pretty annoying NPC invasion, because they tend to invade when you are being chased by toxic dogs. I lure Gothry into this narrow pathway for a one-on-one -on -one fight, and am quite impressed at the critical damage of the Garum Great Axe. There are a few weapons to choose from in this area, even outside of the Garum weapon family, the most notable being Santier's Spear. This is probably one of the most unique weapons in the series, because you can get a whole new weapon by breaking it, but I don't feel like whacking walls for 30 minutes for a 5 minute area, so I'm sticking with the Great Axe. A problem with these big weapons is that the hitboxes can get a little funky trying to get these floor-tall enemies. I was a bit worried about what this could foretell for the area boss. Going through this area is very straightforward, there isn't a whole lot, because like the other rat domain, it is tailored for PvP, so we don't have much business in here. With no preparations to do, I decide I might as well just go straight into the boss room. I was able to take out a few of the dogs, or rats, but as you can see I did end up getting toxic. Thankfully the friendly fire was here to give me a break from all the enemies, and this fight ended up being done on the first try. The Royal Rat Authority also did me a favor by choking the fight with this free attack, 
Well, that actually wasn't so bad. I am pleasantly surprised. I start to level my decks a little more for the road. Next stop is the Brightstone Cove Seldora. There aren't any weapons just lying around before the first boss, unless you count the Staff of Wisdom. I don't even bother trying to get that one with its 50 intelligence requirement, so after looting a few soul items and other miscellaneous goods from the camp, our best bet is to carry on towards the boss arena and beat up the spiders until they drop a weapon. Spiders somehow can drop like 10 different weapons, so we are bound to get something useful. After running back and forth respawning the spiders, I finally get a great scythe and head straight for the boss. This means that we get to use that lovely sweet spot again, and for a pushover like this boss, we don't even need to upgrade it. Of course, as is the case with any room of enemies, I am still on my guard and eventually, Magus is left to be stunlocked without his gank squad to protect him. Cromwell has miracles and some rings, but since none of those status effects are a threat in this area, I don't waste my money. I go back to Majula to level Dex a little more and upgrade the Great Scythe to plus 5. Here we can finally finish up Creighton and Pate's quest, and I side with Creighton, getting the Ring of Thorns for our troubles, and also getting his armor set, which is way cooler than what we have. I stop by his treasure trove to get the engraved gauntlets, which for me are a staple for every playthrough. While I'm exploring, Gothry returns to give me a bit of a hard time, but then again, not really, because he just stands there and lets me kill him. I accidentally lead a whole spider infestation into Ornifex's house, and then just leave them there like a jerk. The last important item here is this Estus Shard. I pick it up before claiming the hidden bonfire. One of the spiders there drops the Mastodon Greatsword. And while I am sad to part with my Great Scythe, I don't really mind the sudden switch. I finally get my dex to 30 and level up the Mastodon Greatsword to plus 5. I am overloaded with this weapon, so unfortunately I have to swap out a few armor pieces and I don't look as cool now. Freya is a really easy boss with the torch's help, so there isn't anything to say about this one. Fighting her with a greatsword can hardly be called a challenge, but this is about having fun, right? Got a lot of souls from this encounter, and with them I start to level up my int and faith a bit more. With our torch ready, it's time to head into the dreaded gutter. I actually don't mind this area. I find it strangely therapeutic to go through lighting all the sconces. But it is a little sad that so much was planned for this area, and it is just a shadow of what it was meant to be. Anyways, before I go off on a tangent, there are weapons scattered throughout the area. You just have to find them in their little nooks. The Dark Pyromancy Flame would be so cool if I had leveled Attunement, but for me, it's just a spicy fist. So I'll switch to Bare Hands for now, since that is faster and more damaging. I do find the Wicked Eye Great Shield, but I don't have enough strength to use it with one hand. Without the strength, the poise damage I do to enemies is more of a trade when so slowed down. And even with two hands, it is really slow and does roughly the same amount of damage my fists can put out in that amount of time. Plus, I don't want to go through this area without a torch. After holding out a little longer, the first weapon I come across is the Great Club, which feels right at home with my waist cloth wearing cave woman. But eventually, I find a few armor sets, starting with the tattered cloth set. Right next to this, there is also a knight who drops his stylish helmet for us, and another short walk away is the Oris set. I can't wear all of it, so I mix and match a few pieces of the various sets. The Gutter Denison also drops the Black Witch set, so that goes into the mix as well. We'll get a chance to wear the full set later. After braving the Gutter, one more challenge stands in our way, as we have a few quests to continue without getting caught by the statues. Down the ledge is where I get a better version of the Ring of Giants. I picked up lots of poison knives, so I use those to help me cheese the giants for an easy victory. With the forgotten key, I talk to Grandal before I forget, and head back into the fray where I have an epic battle of the blunt weapons with Woodland Child Gully. I didn't upgrade the club, so the damage is a bit low, 
but thankfully the rotten itself is also kind of slow. So this fight felt very well paced and decently challenging. Since I've been having problems with equip load, I level vitality up to 12 for a little more freedom with my armor. Ah, Iron Keep. The one I always save for last out of the required areas. Right off the bat, there are not one, but two NPC invaders you have to get rid of. Along with the Elon Knights who chase you at the speed of light. Armorer Dennis is back for more after I so brutally humiliated him in the Forest of Fallen Giants. So I decide to taunt him even further with some meticulously planned mind games. Before we can get a weapon, we have to pull some levers. So in the meantime, I get a life ring plus one to hopefully make the difference between life and death. This jump can be really hard to pull off with 70 knights chasing you, but if you manage to stay calm, you are rewarded with this Vihunder, which is a great choice for any ordeal. I decided that the Jester set is a lot more interesting than the Elan Knight leggings I got, and also perfect if your whole life is one cruel joke. I go home to level this Vihunder to plus two, so I can at least kill the enemies with just one stamina bar. This is more important here than anywhere else, because as we all know, it is nearly impossible to get through that fog gate without killing everything first. Also because of things like this, what is even wrong with this guy? Why is he just standing there when he's right in front of my face? And why does every other knight from the other side of the map manage to aggro? The smelter demon fight is off to a rocky start. It kind of sucks when you go into the fight without realizing that you used your weapon's whole durability on getting rid of every enemy. You know, I kind of thought for a second there that I could first try this without having to do the whole area again. We need more damage for this, so I upgrade this Vihunder to plus four for the next attempt. The only way to beat the smelter demon is with the fuel of desperation to not repeat the run up. All those souls go towards getting strength to 35, and for the final level, I sell all my rings to Gavlin. There's still one more thing to do before we go any further. The pursuer is here to humor us one more time, and give us the ring of blades plus one. While I do clear out Belfry's soul, there isn't anything notable there besides the weapons I picked up at the very end. I also go up the ladder to pick up the Black Knight Great Axe, almost completing the Black Knight weapon set. There isn't really a point in getting this ring, especially since the merchant here gives a better one, but I have nothing else to buy from him, so why not? After nearly dying during this CQC situation with a turtle, I think it's time to try some ranged weapons for a change. Remember the Elan Great Bow we picked up earlier? It's time to break that bad boy in for the old Iron King. The damage is much better than the Bellkeeper Bow was, so this time it might be a viable option. 100 Great Arrows might have been a little overkill, but I just wanted to be sure. For a telegraphed fight like this one, a great bow is not a bad idea at all. It even allows us to hit his normally unreachable head no matter what attack he is doing. So in some ways, a bow is actually better in this fight than a melee weapon. The old Iron King is down in no time. And Aldia speaks with us for the first time in the room below. At this point, I am aiming for 40 decks. I'll do that before working on other stats. In front of the path to the castle is where we originally found our Dragon Slayer's Crescent Axe, and to make my life a little easier, I decide that we can equip it one more time to help us get through Dranglade Castle. There's also some immediate options with the Ghost, as well as an upgraded Bracing Knuckle Ring. I also get some cool gauntlets from this gentleman behind him, equipping those before making off with the Sublime Bone Dust. After I run around in circles and die to the Ruined Sentinels a few times, the correct door is opened, and I can finally escape from their relentless chase. You can't just not equip the poster set of the game, so the Faram set is a lock-in for this area. I can also finally join the Pilgrims of Dark, but that won't come up until a bit later in the playthrough. 
I get rid of the invader so I can talk with Queen Nishandra herself and procrastinate the boss. At first all was well, things seemed to be going normally, but somehow one mistake leads to another, and it all goes downhill when I hit the corner. So like I normally do, I upgraded my weapon a bit before coming back. The second death didn't hurt as much since I made no progress. But on the third attempt, I think I got possessed or something, because look at how clean this fight was. This is the point in time where I'm so sick of it that I'll just autopilot and come out of it like a fever dream. But that arrogance cost me. I may have thought I had ascended, but the mannequins won't let me forget my roots. We have a quick rematch with the Executioner's Chariot and get Gower's Ring. I have no immediate use for it, but come on, how can I say no to this little guy? I go through a lot of the level without realizing I am overloaded. So after some more quick levels, I throw our friendship away like a bad habit. Also, as you can see, I picked up the old knight hammer in the mannequin room for the boss fight. Even though my head just got crushed in, I use what's left of it to mindlessly whack him with my big stick. This almost works, but the shock of the lightning was just too much after all that. I mean, what is that? How can I compete with such perfect teamwork? This time, it was so personal. That stab was charged. Well, anytime there's a struggle to be had, there's a plus five weapon to be made. It helped tremendously. I barely had to heal this time around, and even finished him off before his minion could arrive. That felt really good, and the souls are more than enough to finish leveling dexterity. For the first few minutes, I am stuck punching priests in hopes of getting their gear. Since I gave my robe to Rosabeth, I don't have that anymore, so that's a bummer. But I get super lucky to get the Archdrake Mace after my second attempt. While I still die a few times to the priest group, I can only imagine how much worse it would have been to have to go empty-handed until the second bonfire. Fairly early on in the level, I also get the Slumbering Dragon Shield, which is nice for its passive stamina regeneration effect. After lighting the first bonfire, I have my eyes set on the next weapon for this area. In the safety of this cave is the Helix Halberd, a very interesting looking weapon that I use for the rest of the level. Like the Archdrake Mace, this one has a sweet spot for damage, and that's always a plus. The Shrine of Amana is never a cakewalk, so for some extra security, I level the Helix Halberd to plus three before carrying on. There's nothing to do except head towards the Estus Shard, which is always a little annoying. It always takes more than one trip, but I claim the Estus Shard and make my way towards the next bonfire. I also make a quick stop by this Troll's Lair to get a lovely Life Ring plus two and a simple Singer's Dress. I also manage to get a few pieces of the Archdrake set, namely the Helm and the Boots. The boots match pretty well, don't you think? Without ranged weapons, these corrosive enemies are kind of impossible to deal with without breaking your equipment. It takes me two trips to Majula for repairs to put two and two together that maybe I should just unequip my rings and armor. This and the thrust attack on my halberd works like a charm, and I am able to challenge the NPC invader Peculiar Kindler. I hide behind this well-placed hut to mostly avoid her spells. And with no further interruptions, we are ready for the boss. For some reason, this was one of the longer Demon of Song fights I've had. I do get thrown around a lot too, nearly dying at some point, but after prioritizing the strong attack, it becomes a lot easier, and we can leave the Shrine of Amana behind us. I also get Cyan's Halberd from the guard posted outside of the Undead Crypt entrance, which may be useful at some point. We make our way towards the crypt and speak with Aldia again before returning to Majula. I used the souls to level ADP again this time, since I've been neglecting it for a bit. So, I lost the footage of the first five minutes of this area, but thankfully I didn't accomplish anything in that time, 
Basically, I was beating everything with my fists and dying over and over again until I realized that I could technically use the Cyan's Halberd since it is a possible drop in this area. I also bought the Ring of Thorns from Agdane. The next thing of interest I get is the Bracing Knuckle Ring plus two and some Lydia Gauntlets from one of the witches. After clearing most of the area, I leveled the Cyan's Halberd to plus five. This is a very short area so there isn't anything else of note besides the area boss. In general, Velstot is a very slow-paced fight. He is great at whiff punishing, and with a slower weapon, you don't ever get to hit him more than once. So it goes without saying that this could lead to some impatience and burnout. That's not what was supposed to happen. Clearly, we are at the big boys now. This is a late game boss, so I need to be leveling my weapons accordingly. Well, that's depressing. The upgraded weapon really took the edge off this fight, and doing a lot more damage, of course, meant that I didn't have to spend as long on each attempt, and we can finally move on. We visit Vendrick, pick up his ring, and head back to Majula. For now, I get ADP to 20 and start working on my casting stats for the end game. So I, uh, also didn't record, like, the first five minutes of this. But you know those little petrify rat dogs running around this place? They can drop the whole Black Knight collection. So this means that I have my choice of any Black Knight weapon for this area. Because who wants to farm for another one? Look at how ridiculous this is, though. I just got a BK Ultra Greatsword from this, which is the only weapon I am missing. You can also use the malformed skull dropped by this mimic, but the only thing I need from it is the dark mask. After killing one of the easiest invaders who Lucatil apparently could never beat, we talk to our friendly philanthropic sorcerer. And since he sells the Black Witch set, I equip the one we already have to turn into a pretty sick looking necromancer witch. I take out this section's Forlorn and also kill this giant basilisk who drops a new helmet for me. The skeleton mask is cool and all, but why would I be a skeleton when I can be in a mog- Honestly, the scythe Forlorn kinda cuts me like grass. Anytime I win, it is pure luck. Forlorn just does not play around. I don't know if it's just me, but I always feel like hitting Forlorn doubles the durability damage to your weapon. My weapons break so much while fighting a single Forlorn. After trying to claim the prize behind Forlorn, I inadvertently end up being chased by two trolls. So while I wait for them to de-aggro, I might as well pick up Aldia's key as well. I return and safely claim a new weapon, the Malformed Shell. This will be interesting because this is another weapon I have never tried before. I think I like this one. After prancing through Aldia's torture chamber doing nothing in particular, I decide it's time to properly test our new weapon. It's unupgraded, but still does great damage on the Guardian Dragon. After the battle, I start to upgrade Intelligence and Faith more, but also Attunement, so I can hopefully try out spells for at least one boss during this run. Once again, I lost the footage for the first five minutes. Something went wrong during this particular recording session. So I went back to this roost to show what I did. I killed the Hellkite Drake for a Flame Quartz Ring, I got the Dragon Tooth from the Nest, and also picked up a Bolt Stone, which means we will use an infused weapon for the first time in this playthrough. With that out of the way, this is another short area, and there's nothing left to do but make the trek to the Ancient Dragon. There's a pretty cool armor set behind the Pharaoh's Contraption to pick up as well. I don't know what happened here. Apparently I don't know how to fight these guys with a tooth. Eventually, we can finally talk to the dragon to get the Ashen Mist Heart. But I didn't come all the way here just for a chat. So we're leveling our tooth to plus four for the occasion. I'll be honest with you, I have no excuse for doing so poorly on this fight when I have the most optimal weapon possible. Even with this high damage, lightning infused rock, this fight takes me a couple of tries. This is more frustrating than other bosses because of the ancient dragon's abnormally large health bar. 
I feel like the more I fight this, the less I understand the fire attack. Why do I get hit no matter where I go? After figuring out this good safe spot, I finally get lucky enough to bait the standing fire breath, and the ancient dragon is gone. I just had to gesture for this one. Finally, one attunement slot. Oh goody! With the Ashen Mist Heart, we can finally go into the memories for the remaining giant souls. First, I return to Freya's arena to pick up the ancient dragon soul from its memory. For the sake of this playthrough, I count every memory as one area, so for the giant lord, I can only use equipment I find in other memories. In this case, I will use the curved dragon greatsword from the dragon's soul. Before I can get into the first memory, I have a rather inconvenient altercation with Forlorn. The memory of Oro has a unique armor set for us, which is hidden behind the pharaoh's contraption. The steel set is too heavy to wear without being overloaded, but even just the chest piece provides us with good defense for the boss fight. After this, I go to the memory of Vamar for the last giant soul before the boss. Every DS2 player has memorized this battle by heart, so this one isn't much of a problem. I only did one upgrade on the sword, just in case, and also tried out the special attack for fun, and I gotta say, maybe I wasn't fully hitting him. But for the durability you lose, I don't feel like it is really worth it. At least for me, the damage seemed to be very underwhelming. So after beating the giant lord, I get out of there as fast as possible to, uh, Never return again. <laughs> I put all those levels into intelligence and faith, because I am still set on being able to be a caster at some point in the playthrough. I stop by Ornifex's house to make the sacred chime hammer for the next boss fight. I also get the thorned greatsword in case I want to use that one as well. I start to work on attunement a bit more, and then go to upgrade my weapon. Since this is one of the last bosses of the base game, I figure I'll go all in and upgrade this thing to max. Before proceeding, I put on the armor I picked up from the Cyan Knights as well. I thought it might be a bit of a nice challenge to fight him with a weapon he has a resistance to. I was half right. While the weapon is max level and the damage is by no means bad, I have the hardest time on this fight that I've had in the whole playthrough. I think this rivals the Executioner's Chariot in death count, but I didn't check. This is kinda like the Ancient Dragon where I am by no means handicapped, I just am bad at the game. And like, I really don't get why this was such a struggle for me. All you have to do is circle around his left leg and he literally cannot hit you. In theory, this should have been the easiest fight in the game. He's learning. He's getting in the corner. He's not gonna let me get behind him. After what turned into 11 attempts, I nearly throw this fight by trying to taunt him with a weapon art for the kill. And come on. I'm not gonna leave this place without gesturing. I return with enough levels to get another attunement slot. Before challenging the final boss, I speak with the Chancellor to get the Llewellyn set. Besides re-equipping the ring he sells, I also take a look at the new weapons in his shop, picking one to take with us to the boss fight. The one I end up going with is the Bound Hand Axe. Because it looks cool, and because I haven't used a lot of axes during this playthrough, Aside from that, I also bring the Thorned Greatsword we got from the Looking Glass Knight Soul. I upgrade the ladder to plus three and sell all my old equipment to Gavlin, so we have enough souls to upgrade the former to max level. During the fights, I tend to alternate between the axe and greatsword, testing out which does better damage or which moveset works best. I don't really have an easy time with the Throne Watcher and Defender, and it takes a few tries before I can finally beat them. The weapon that pulls through in the end is the Thorned Greatsword. 
and with a little change in strategy, I realized that fighting them one at a time is best since, as you can see, the defender staggers while trying to revive his teammate. My first few attempts with Nishandra were messy. I made dumb mistakes and kind of just ignored the curse buildup that was sapping away my health. Admittedly, I usually use range or spells to beat her, so it was refreshing to actually feel challenged by this fight for once. After figuring out what is probably an obvious strategy, I lure her away without having to dispel all of the curse fog and, like her hubby, I circle around her left a uh, leg thingy to dodge her swings and easily finish her. Aldia is much easier to beat, unlike the other two. I am able to cleanly finish them off on the first try. I use both of my weapons for this fight, but the bound hand axe was the real star here, with its faster DPS and recovery time. And so, after a long odyssey through the janky lands of Dranglake, we can have a rest on our throne as the next monarch. But, our journey is far from over. We have one more base game boss to face, the Dark Lurker. For this one, I had to do a lot of preparation. The first thing I did was grab the Soul of the King for some extra souls. I also jumped off a cliff, you'll see why. The soul of the king in all our giant souls net us over a hundred thousand souls. My goal right now is to even our int and faith out to 20, and maybe try for another attunement slot. To make this a little easier, I go to respawn the giant lord for some easy money. But don't worry, I'm still faithful to the run even when giant farming. The souls from that are enough to get the stats I wanted and get the Forbidden Sun pyromancy from the assassination quest. So, why exactly do I need pyromancies to fight the Dark Lurker? Well, allow me to explain. The Dark Chasm of Old is the only area in the game where there are no items at all. Nothing. Not only did that seem kind of boring, but also maddening to go through all those enemies and the Dark Lurker with only fists. So, I decided to get a little creative for this. I looked up a list of items and equipment used by the phantom enemies in the area, and decided I would instead only use items used by the NPCs in the area. Out of my options, I picked the Shodel from the Desert Sorceress and the Pyromancies from the Xanthus Set Wearer. I also can use the imported set that is worn by the knife-wielding phantom, but the pyromancies come with another limitation. I can only use the same pyromancies that the phantom uses. Out of the list, I chose Forbidden Sun and Great Combustion because that was all my slots would allow. The shodel is mainly for picking off the enemies before the fight, and I will only use pyromancies to fight Dark Lurker, so it goes without saying that I'm gonna need to pack as many herbs as I can. After a long, long time of trying to lure out phantoms one at a time and lead them off the edges, I finally can challenge the Dark Lurker. As you can see, damage is not gonna be an issue. The challenge comes in with having very few windows to attack, based on the types of spells I am using, as well as the low amount of casts before I have to refresh them. Due to this, this was a very fun fight for me. It forced me to really plan my attacks and anticipate openings. And I finally was able to tap into my hidden patient side. With the base game all wrapped up, it's time to challenge the DLC bosses. This starts out with a lot of running around empty-handed while picking up a few defensive rings. The earliest weapon you can get here is the Longbow plus 7. Sure, it is super boring and also a base game weapon, but it will be super helpful for the platforming in this area. I also pick up the Sanctum Mace, which poisons you every time you swing it. So while I have to use it sparingly, it is better than having no melee weapon at all. There is, however, a workaround. As long as you hit enemies with a critical attack, 
you can avoid the poison effect. While I'm in this little treasure room, I pick up the Katarina Helm. A bit further down, and I find a good weapon to use, the Puzzling Stone Sword. Not only is it a very cool looking weapon, but the moveset is also very fun and unique. I upgrade it to max since the damage is pretty low. We make easy work of Jester Thomas and activate the stone to open the path to the Sanctum. I pick up the Drake Blood Greatsword before moving on. Alana, on her own, is no threat at all, and our Puzzling Stone Sword puts out some quick DPS. Of course, she is fully aware of this, so she resorts to summoning her gank squad while she spams spells in the corner. The whip attack is pretty useful for taking out skeletons, but as luck would have it, she summons a Poison Velstot next, which drags this fight out to well over five minutes. To add insult to injury, she uses a dried finger and summons three skeletons yet again. As long as you are patient, you can still focus on her without ever attacking the other enemies. It just takes a while. I bring out the Drake Blood Greatsword for the next fight, leveling it to plus three. In other news, we got another attunement slot. Our Greatsword does excellent damage against Sin, but the gimmick of this fight is that hitting him does abnormally high damage to your weapon. So I have the Puzzling Stone Sword in my back pocket if things go awry. I don't manage to first try this one, but on the third try, I got some really good RNG. He didn't fly a single time during this fight, he kinda just stayed in the corner doing that one attack where he stands on his hind legs. We finish him off with the Puzzling Stone Sword, and can say goodbye to the sunken city of olden times. All those souls go straight into ADP for the Broom Tower. As I head to the Broom Tower, things immediately start to get hectic the moment I step past the bonfire. Forlorn kinda just invades while I'm already getting blown up by the Ashen Idol, and we have sort of a cartoon chase scene across the chain. On the way back, I am already a step ahead and punch them, watching them plunge to their doom. The first available weapon is, once again, just an upgraded base game weapon, but I realized that I haven't used a fist weapon for the whole playthrough, so we're gonna stick with it. I run down to get the Majestic Greatsword since it has a unique moveset in the left hand. The Caestus by itself is actually pretty good. The DPS is a little crazy. While in the barrel room, I get some nice, form-fitting leggings from a Fume Sorcerer. She may be a quick sword, but is she a quick wit? I retrieve the Scorching Iron Scepter so we can finally make our way to Fume Knight. But before that, I am sure to upgrade both of my weapons some more. I also sidetrack to get a very important piece of gear, which I can't beat the Fume Knight without. I do everything I need to do to prepare, and dash straight in there with nothing to lose. The first attempt goes pretty well, but I don't get him first try. As it tends to go, I do progressively worse and end up attempting into the double digits before finally getting him. I realized that I didn't equip the Flame Quartz Ring plus three, which is probably a necessity for this fight as much as I get hit. I mainly use the sword to beat him, but the Caestus is a great tool for quicker pokes. After the 11th attempt, I finally can relax for a second while I get things ready for the next fight. I switch to the crown as a trophy of my victory over the Fume Knight. Now that we have his armor, we are going to the next fight looking too cool for school. But that's not all we bring. I also make the Fume Sword to replace the Caestus as a backup weapon. I upgrade it to plus two so it does semi-competent damage, and upgrade the Majestic Greatsword again for good measure. I get some more ADP to be on the safe side too. The run-up to this is pretty demoralizing, but I wasn't gonna let this get in my way. My first attempt was pretty sloppy, but once I get in the rhythm, I do a little better on each consecutive attempt, except for this one. Eventually, I start to ignore all the knights chasing me, and just go for the lizard, and to my surprise, it actually works. So the run-up from here on out isn't so bad after all. 
I have some close calls on my winning attempt, but our setup is pretty good for this fight. While the Fume Sword does very low damage, it is great for conserving stamina and getting safe hits. For certain attacks, attacking with this ensures I can do damage and also recover quick enough to dodge. Now that that's done, I level ADP to 25 and put a little more into Vitality since I don't know what to level. Now it's time to complete the final DLC. This one is also my personal favorite. As usual, the first weapon we get is an unupgraded base game weapon. This time, we get to reunite with the wing spear we used in the first area for the last area. How poetic. I make my way up this hill to get a super stylish bell helm. A little down the road, we get the Ring of the Embedded, which is like the Sword Seal for all you Elden Ring fans. I'm just minding my own business when Forlorn decides once again to make my life worse. Luckily, I pick up the Rampart Golem Lance to replace my Wing Spear, and it is pretty reliable. I upgrade it to plus 10 before heading back out to fight the first boss. The Lance does very good damage, but unfortunately, it has extremely low durability, which makes it risky for using against bosses. I didn't realize this until too late, and with no repair powder in my hotbar, I was doomed. From then on out, I keep some repair powder close by to ensure something like that doesn't happen again. Alsana breaks her seal, and we can pick up the vessel shield. This thing is absolutely amazing. Keeping it on your back will boost almost every stat. I make the Ivory Straight Sword, which we can test some throughout the area. The only chore I have before the Ivory King is to collect the three knights scattered throughout the area. I also backtrack to get the North Warder set for some extra protection. The good thing about the Lance is that we can poke the bunny wheels through the shield which doesn't seem like much, but was a lifesaver for me in some moments. I get rid of this little pest and proceed to the cave. I easily take down the Covetous Demon and claim the Ivory Warrior Ring. I upgrade the Ivory Straight Sword to plus four and go to fight the Burnt Ivory King. To save durability, I use the Lance to pick off the minions, but I am vastly disappointed by the damage output of this thing and each hit takes a lot of durability meaning this weapon will break long before we are anywhere near killing him. So after a few more mind-numbing grinds through the Charred Warriors, I finally can take him out with the Rampart Golem Lance. It was a long journey, but we have now beaten every area in Dark Souls 2. Thank you so much for watching and look forward to more challenge videos for Dark Souls and Elden Ring in the future.